Okay, right. So let's let's start. Um, so welcome everyone. I hope everyone has had a good week. Um, so this is the third talk of the course, and uh, today we'll be talking about four noble truths. Now, after Buddha's enlightenment, he began a teaching career that spanned 45 years till he passed away at the age of 80. His first disciples were the five ascetics who had originally actually abandoned him when Buddha renounced the path of self-mortification. And the first teachings he gave them was that of the middle way, followed by the four noble truths. These teachings were to become known as the first turning of the wheel of Dharma. Dharma could be taken as uh, Buddhism, basically. Uh, I mean, in, in uh, Sanskrit it means uh, natural law or, or religion. Uh, it's got several meanings. It is rather appropriate that the first teachings that the Buddha gave to the ascetics was that of the middle way. As Buddha had discovered, it is not profitable to cling to extremes. So I'll just read out what Piyadasi writes in The Buddha's Ancient Path. It's one of the books I've recommended. He said, living in the palace amidst song and dance, luxury and pleasure, the prince knew by experience that sense pleasures do not lead mankind to true happiness and deliverance. Six years of rigorous mortification, which he as an ascetic so zealously, zealously practiced in search of purification and final deliverance, brought him no reward. It was a vain and useless effort. Avoiding these two extremes, he followed a path of moral and mental training and through self-experience discovered the middle way. So Buddha himself discovered that it's not useful to cling to extremes. And we should always remember this teaching about avoiding the extremes during our practice. If you're becoming too rigid, too artificial, um, too stubborn about something, then something is going wrong. And on the other hand, if we just keep on chasing our fancies and passions and sensual delights without restraint, that too is not right. So it's the middle way between the two. There should be a natural ease and joy within our practice. And the middle way is encapsulated in the path of practice, which is known as the Noble Eightfold Path. And this is the fourth of the Four Noble Truths. Uh, the Four Noble Truths were realized by the Buddha while seated in contemplation under the Bodhi tree. And this is what he talked about next to the Five Ascetics. When he gave his sermon at the Deer Park in Isipatna. So, Wongdu, can you put up the slide, uh, the first slide? Right. Okay, so the Four Noble Truths is the core of Buddhist teaching, and the Four Noble Truths are there on the screen. So the first Noble Truth is that of suffering, and the, the Sanskrit word for suffering is Dukkha, and we'll look at that word in much more detail next week. I'll, I'll talk about it today as well, but uh, we'll, uh, so we'll, we'll, we'll get an idea of what that word means. It's usually translated as suffering, but the word suffering isn't quite adequate as a, as a translation. So the first truth is noble truth of suffering. And basically it says, you know, that is our usual human condition. 
The second noble truth is the origin of suffering, why it arises, in other words. The third noble truth is the extinction of suffering. So this noble truth basically says that it is possible to be liberated from the suffering. And the fourth noble truth is the path that leads to the extinction of suffering. In other words, it's the path, it is the path of practice. So we'll talk about the first noble truth to start with. Wangdu, you can uh, remove the slide. So the first noble truth basically says that suffering is part and parcel of our human condition. Our existence is basically at its core dissatisfactory and is suffering. And it is describing how we feel quite often. We feel anguish, we feel sense of not being complete, um, we feel misery, sorrow, fear, unhappiness, worry, anxiety, frustration, and numerous un un unpleasant states. And dukkha encompasses all these feelings. It can be, it can range from major life events, uh, like losing someone we love, death, being made redundant, to minor things like, you know, just feeling some sort of irritation or just a, just a general feeling of disease, dis ease, not feeling at ease, where just things just don't seem to be right for us. Um, uh, so it could be just that sort of feeling. Uh, and so I'll just give some examples. Um, so, you know, where, when we are at a supermarket and we are queuing up to pay and there is someone in front of us who's determined to get rid of all their change, all their pennies, and is, uh, you know, slowly count, counting them out and we might be in a rush and, you know, we are saying to ourselves, wish we would hurry up and getting irritated. That is Luca. Another example, you know, we might go on a holiday to a sandy tropical beach. We get up in the morning and we look out of the window, you know, and all is glorious, you know, beautiful blue skies, blue sea, uh, white sands, and we go out and to have our breakfast and laid out in front of us on the beach is the whole breakfast and we could have anything. And, you know, we, we pick the things we like and we're asked what drink we would like and we ask for tea. And because in the country that we are um, traveling in, they probably don't drink tea and they bring tea, which seems weak and insipid to us. And we are used to having strong black English breakfast tea. And so just in, in the midst of everything seeming glorious, there is this little feeling of something we do not like. That is Dukkha. Or we want to be in a relationship. Whatever we do, nothing seems to work out. That is Dukkha. We may have called a call center, been put on hold for 20 minutes, and then someone answers the phone, and we explain in minute detail exactly what our problem is, and the person at the other end just does not seem to understand and just keeps on giving us pet answers, and eventually we lose our cool and start shouting down the phone line. That is Dukkha. Um, so, Luca can range from major events 
to little minor irritations in the way things are that it doesn't su suit me. And when, look, when we look at it this way, who amongst us can say that, no, Buddha was not right, I've never felt suffering. And indeed, you know, chances are that even in course of this day, even if we have been gloriously happy, there have been moments not quite to our liking. And in the first noble truth, Buddha says that this is the basic fact of existence. You know, I've said many times now that practice is a necessary part of Buddhism. And one practices, one brings to consciousness the suffering which we might otherwise cover over or, or not notice. And just because we've covered over it or not noticed it does not mean that it will go away. And even in unconsciousness, it can simmer away and build. So we need to bring dukkha that is there into consciousness so that we can acknowledge it and then work with it. And this is the first step in transforming dukkha. So for example, you know, when um, someone has left milk on the counter and not put it back in the fridge, after us having told them many, many times not to do that, to always put the milk back in the fridge, and we notice it's out on the counter again, and we feel anger, we just notice that anger, label it, perhaps, if you want, and say there is anger. When you come to the third noble truth, we will see that it says that there is cessation of suffering. But for cessation to occur, we first have to be aware of suffering in all its manifestations, big and small, and acknowledge that it is there. I'll give um, one story which one of the teachers who teaches Buddhism at the society uh, once gave from her early days in the practice of Buddhism. She was thinking to herself, surely I'm a very reasonable, even-minded person. I do not get irritated, annoyed, impatient. So she decided to do an experiment. She took a handful of paper clips and put them in her right pocket. And whenever she noticed a reaction of no, not now, or hurry up. Any of those reactions come up, she would transfer a paper clip from her right pocket to her left pocket. And she found by the end of the day that she had run out of paper clips in her right pocket. That is the nature of suffering. And that is what the first noble truth is saying. Now, I've talked about dukkha in its many forms. Some of them could be major, you know, like death of someone we love, um, um, a relationship breaking up, or it could be something minor, just a minor irritation, or just not, uh, just feeling uneasy about things, perhaps. Um, so, you know, the, the range of dukkha is wide. You know, it could be major life events or it could be something minor. The way we work with dukkha is the same whether it is a major, uh, something major within our life or it's something minor. The way we work with it is the same. We bring it to consciousness and that's the first step in starting to work with it. And actually, uh, when you start working with it, although the major um, dukkha is very easy to see, we're advised to work with the minor things to start with because there is so much energy in 
the major suffering, major things that cause us suffering, um, that we do not yet have the, we, we haven't yet built the strength to, to work with uh, the, the, that type of suffering. So we are advised to work with just those minor things, you know, minor irritation, just, uh, you know, as I said, you know, when you're in the supermarket, you're getting irritated with someone there. Um, and, you know, we live in a, uh, I mean, I live in a big city, I, I guess uh, uh, some of uh, you do too. And living in a big city, you're going to come across, you know, when you go out, people who are going to annoy you one way or the other. Uh, so just notice that. And that's working with the minor irritations. So that's what we start with, because the major irritations have too much energy for us to be able to contain it uh, um, and to work with it. Um, and it may overwhelm us. Um, so th that's by working with um, the minor irritations, we are building up strength, we are building up familiarity with this uh, energy, and then it just naturally helps us deal with, uh, you know, bigger and bigger events in our life. So I'll just read out um, Buddha's words. Buddha said, what then, months, is the noble truth of suffering? Birth is suffering, decay is suffering, sickness is suffering, death is suffering, to be in situations one does not like is suffering, the separation from what one likes is suffering, not to get what one wants is suffering. Okay, so that's the first noble truth. We can now go to the second noble truth. The second noble truth is the origin of suffering. It asks, so what lies at the bottom of this unsatisfactoriness? Why do we suffer? And this is what the second truth looks at and in a word what underlies it is craving it's uh sometimes uh, the sanskrit word trishna is used uh trishna means thirst so craving again doesn't give the right connotation because sometimes as i said it could be something minor just feeling uneasy about something um so uh, Craving, usually craving means, you know, we're really hankering after something, but it may not be as, as, as much as that. It could be just something minor. So uh, although it quite often this is translated as craving, Trishna is often translated also as thirst. So perhaps thirst, thirst for something uh, that, that gives uh, perhaps a better indication um, of what, what we're looking at. So what lies underneath our suffering is our underlying craving for what is pleasant and to avoiding what is unpleasant that is what lies at the bottom of it and if we recall last week's uh, talk and if we recall the three fires that's what the three fires deal with it, the three fires are craving um, then the second fire is that of anger or ill will. And the third fire is that of flawed seeing, avidya, or sometimes it's translated as ignorance. Ignorance meaning not really knowing the way things really are. So, so actually what, lie, uh, uh, what lies under our suffering, what causes the suffering are those three fires. And so, um, uh, craving, uh, it's it said here, craving is uh, what, what leads to the suffering. But actually, you know, under the underlying all that is avidya, ignorance of the way re things really are. We do not see the reality as it really is. And that, that saying is actually very profound. Um, 
it, it takes time to uh, to see it um, but at least you know while we are starting off with Buddhism it, it is still possible to work with craving uh, uh, and, and you know I, I, I will uh, talk about how we work with it so if, uh, in the words of the first discourse that Buddha gave what then monks is the noble truth of the origin of suffering it is craving or trishna that gives rise to rebirth together with the pleasure and greed that seeks delight here and there the craving or thirst for sensual pleasure the craving or thirst for further existence the craving or thirst for non-existence So the just to explain uh, craving for non-existence, well, it, it could be something major like you know not liking the life that has been handed to us and wanting to end our life. It can mean that, but also it can mean um, um, you know just wanting to get rid of unpleasant state. You know, someone we don't like, we just don't want anything to do with them. So that that's like that's craving for non-existence craving for non-existence of things we don't like. So when we experience something pleasant, we want it to continue. We will rearrange the world, the circumstances, so that we can have more of it. It does not matter whether what gives us pleasure is something major like falling in love or something small like enjoying a particular dish. The underlying inner mechanism of wanting it to continue is the same. And Buddhism actually gets us to examine our inner world that we are carrying in ourselves. We have built a picture of what the world is, how one thing can lead to another, and we manipulate things and circumstances to bring out pleasant experiences and to avoid avoiding the unpleasant ones and we when we really look at this and this is what meditation enables us to do we are constantly in this flood of manipulating circumstances constantly picking and choosing now actually there would be no problem with picking and choosing um, after all it's natural that you know we want more of pleasant things and uh, uh, none of unpleasant things you know that that there's there's nothing wrong with that uh, uh, you know when we look at it that way but there is a problem with that which is that the picture of the world that we have is flawed and as I say that flow is referred to as avidya the picture that we have of the world is that you, that we, we that things are permanent and that we can grasp at that now if the true reality is ever changing it's changing from moment to moment which means that there is nothing that carries on from one moment to the next so in that ever changing moment and uh, so what happens is um, if i can just explain this a little bit more so um buddhism buddhism says that every moment is a new moment uh, and every moment is um, influenced by all the circumstances surrounding it and because the circumstances surrounding it are changing every moment is different whereas our senses actually pick up what that moment uh, it's saying uh, like seeing something for example and uh, then our senses grasp that uh, our perceptions grasp that and our brains then start manipulating uh, what what we have seen but meanwhile while all that is happening that moment has moved on and the new moment has arrived and we are no longer in the moment 
we are no longer in the true reality. What we are in is grasping of what we have seen and then manipulating it with our mental images um, uh, of, you know, and then we put uh, um, uh, uh, things on it like, I like this, I don't like this, I'd like to have more of it. And so we build up pictures and then that's what we are living out of. Whereas the true reality is, is uh, moving moment by moment, it's changing moment by moment. If we stay with that, without the distortion that we normally see, then it is possible to uh, actually see reality as it is. And then it is possible to actually enjoy things that are coming to be and ceasing to be within our domain because we, we you know they come to us uh, for uh, you know momentarily then then it, the next moment changes and you know if it uh, perhaps it, it's something that the next moment pro probably produces the same thing um so uh, and so minds you know when when um the same things uh, are be, uh, uh, being produced from moment to moment, take it as if there is something real there. It's a bit like, you know, um, if, you, if you think about the old style of uh, how films were shown in a cinema, there would be a series of pictures on, on the film reel, and each picture would be slightly different uh, 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 to the next one. So, uh, so if someone's walking, you know, the, the, um, there'll be a series of pictures where um, the, the pictures are evolving slightly differently. And, you know, once they are uh, projected onto the screen, um, all those pictures are coming rapidly one by one. And what we see on the screen is real people walking. We see real stories. We see people falling in love, people falling out of love, um, so all sorts of things. Whereas the reality is just those changing pictures, momentary pictures, that's what it is. So this is a bit like how our brains actually grasp onto things and, and project pictures. Uh, whereas, you know, the uh, reality is ever changing from moment to moment. So delusion uh, of Lord seeing, um, exists because we we see permanence in things and events and we feel that satisfaction can be derived from things and events and that there is a self or i and or me that needs um the the enjoyment from these events so you know these are three false ways of seeing reality as we say the true marks of reality are uh, and that is the last week, are impermanence, suffering, and no self-identity. We see it exactly the opposite. We see, we see things as being permanent, capable of giving us pleasure, and um, having things having self-identity, including ourselves. So, because we Bays are seeing on wrong assumptions that, that there is permanence, there, there is self-identity to things, that thing, we can grasp at things, whereas, you know, things are ever-changing. Trying to grasp them is like trying to grasp a fistful of water. We'll never succeed. And as I said last week, uh, even though we cannot grasp at things, in other words, we cannot create attachment to those things, um, they, they can still be enjoyed while they are there. So, you know, if, if we are in a relationship, we can enjoy the relationship as long as, you know, we are also aware of the other side of reality that, you know, what we are dealing with is a, a very profound impermanence. And then, as I say, we can enjoy whatever comes within our domain because, like I said last week, it is like receiving guests. And, you know, we can enjoy their company, but then when it's time for them to part, then we say goodbye. But, of course, it's not as easy as that, and that's why we need 
the path of practice. So in this lesson, we will not actually go into how our flawed seeing actually arises, um, but Buddhism does explain in minute detail how our deluded seeing arises. And the prime doctrine where this is explained is that of Prachitya Samupada, or it's translated as dependent arising sometimes, uh, and also uh, the doctrine of karma, uh, which we will cover in a later talk. So to summarize the second noble truth, the basic cause of suffering is desire or craving. And it can be said that desire or craving is rooted in our ignorance of the way things really are. So we can now go on to the third noble truth. The third, for the third noble truth, I'll just read out what Buddha said. He said, what then, monks, is the noble truth of the stopping of suffering? It is the extinction of that craving or thirst, renouncing it, forsaking it, liberation and detachment from it. So, us being blown about willy-nilly by our passions, you know, what we want, what we don't like, our anger, you know, we are constantly being blown about here and there by it, by our picking and choosing, and that world that we live in of being blown about here and there by our passions is called samsara. And it can be said that our mundane world is samsara because it mainly consists of us just really being blown about from one state to another. You know, we feel that we are actually leading a very consistent life, but when you really see underlying what's underlying it, you know, it's like we were just being blown about here and there. And liberation from samsara is called nirvana. Nirvana has the roots, has the root near, meaning extinguishing, and va, meaning blowing, as in the wind. So nirvana is the extinguishing or cessation of being blown about here and there. It is the liberation from suffering. And Buddha's great insight was that it is possible to be liberated from dukkha. We're not doomed to be caught up in this round of dukkha forever. But the choice is ours, whether we want to be in this continuous round of dukkha or to be liberated from it. To be liberated from it, we have to do something about it we have to walk the path that is that has been set up by Buddha. And this is the Noble Eightfold Path, which is in fact the fourth Noble Truth, and which we will actually talk about next week. So it said Nirvana is ineffable. In other words, it cannot be described in words. To know it, one has to experience it, which again means to walk with us path. It is to open up a new seeing, but you know, our normal way of seeing is so ingrained in us, you know, basically it, it's been ingrained uh, from our birth, but uh, classically we can say it's been ingrained in us even uh, uh, from past lives, according to classic Buddhism. So, so you know, it, it's something that we've inherited. Uh, so therefore, it, you know, the path is long. You know, we mustn't expect quick results uh, because, you know, it's a total, totally new way of seeing, which will take time for, for it to come about. And in fact, again, in Buddha's words, 
Buddha said, it occurred to me, monks, that this, that this Dharma I realize is deep, hard to see, hard to understand, peaceful and sublime, beyond mere reasoning, subtle and intelligible to the wise. But this generation delights, revels, and rejoices in sensual pleasures. For a generation delighting, reveling, and rejoicing in sensual pleasures, it is hard to see the extinction of craving, dispassion, cessation, nibbana. Nibbana is the Pali word for nirvana. Um, so I'll just read it out again. It occurred to me, monks, that this Dharma I've realized is deep, hard to see, hard to understand, peaceful and sublime, beyond mere reasoning. So it, we cannot um, think our way through it because it's uh, actually beyond intellectual um, uh, thinking. We cannot, you know, um, like say, for example, uh, uh, when at school we've learned, you know, maths or um, uh, history, you know, we learn facts, you know, we, and we build on them. It's not an intellectual process, actually. These are insights that have to arise, and they, they are beyond, beyond the intellectual um, way of doing things. Um, uh, but, but if we, if we practice, you know, it does open up. So, so I'll just carry on reading. So he said, um, it, it's beyond mere reasoning, subtle and intelligible to the wise. And in fact, he said that all beings, but all beings have the power and the wisdom of Tathagata. Tathagata is another appellation for the Buddha. What that means is that each and every one of us is actually capable of seeing it, just like Buddha did. It's not that some people are and some people are not able to. Some people might have to work harder um, because of uh, their um, karma that they might have accumulated, and we'll talk about karma. Uh, uh, but uh, uh, it is possible for every one of us to understand this. Uh, or to come to the realization. So I'll carry on with what he said. He said, but this generation delights, revels, and rejoices in sensual pleasures. For a generation delighting, reveling, and rejoicing in sensual pleasures, it is hard to see the extinction of craving, dispassion, cessation, nibbana. Now, these were the words spoken by Buddha two and a half thousand years ago. And he says, in, in his time, in his generation, he's saying, his generation delights, revels, and rejoices in sensual pleasures. And for his generation, delighting, reveling, and rejoicing in sensual pleasures, it is hard to see, you know, this teaching. Uh, now, that's interesting, isn't it? We can act actually say the same thing for ourselves, can't we? We delight, revel, and rejoice in sensual pleasures. And for us, delighting, reveling, and, re and rejoicing in sensual pleasures, it is difficult to see uh, the, 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 the truth. So, so you know, um, we you know, two and a half thousand years after Buddha, we have got all sorts of comforts which did not exist in Buddha's time. You know, we can speak, pick, pick up the phone and speak to our aunt in Australia if, if we want. Um, we, a lot of things that people died of uh, at that time, you know, are just minor illnesses now. Um, so, you know, we've got, we've made so much progress. There's been so much material progress, yet our human condition is still the same. Our suffering is still the same. And the path out of the suffering is still the same. 
so and Buddha said you know Nirvana is hard to realize but it can be realized if we are willing to put the effort in okay so we can leave um, the uh, talk for today there and uh, we can open the uh, session for questions or comments or observations if you if you put your hand up if you put your virtual hand up then i'll be able to see you more easily so if you do that if you are asking a question please or if you wanted to you could put it in chat and Wong Du will read it out for me incidentally um while we're waiting for questions uh so as i as I said uh, in the beginning, if you've registered for the course, the videos of the talks are actually put uh, on the uh, on the class uh, part of the website. So if you're registered, you'll be able to see the videos and also my notes. Also, I've noticed um, that the the first talk is also available under the video library for which you need not have Regist uh, registered you know it's open to everyone so the first talk is available there i don't know if they are going to if the society is going to put further talks in the video library but it's certainly there uh, under the class section of the website um but for that you need to have registered and there's a button that you can press to register um uh, for the class and the other question someone had sent was how to get hold of one of the books i recommended which is living buddhism uh, so if you go to the buddhist society website uh, and, and uh, there's a tab called shop if you click on that you'll see all the books that are for sale uh, by the society and you can order it uh, on the website so it's called living buddhism it's it's uh, actually fairly easy to read um, so if you are going to read something in your I mean you have my my own notes that are uh, under the class uh, section of the website but uh, you know this book living Buddhism is quite an easy read as well so yes if there are any questions uh, so I see uh, yeah common sorry a uh, common grant sorry you, you know yes. who you are so no, sorry, my name's Howard. That's the name of my computer. Hi, okay. Rohit. Hi. Could you, sorry, could you keep your uh, virtual hand up? Because what happens is you disappear from the screen if, if your hand is not up. Yeah, great. I can see you. Sorry. Now. How's that? Can you hear me as well? Yes, yes. Um, I just want to, if it's okay, type a few loose ends based on yeah. last week and this week. So yeah, sure. I think what we said last week is um, there's a natural law that if things operate within this, that yeah. then there's no suffering and and you said today that that was maybe dharma yeah. and this week we're saying nirvana is the new way of seeing or seeing correctly yeah and is is it right then that the natural law is summed up in the three signs of being so that's effectively true reality that is the way of things is that is that right yeah yeah that that is that is right yeah so that that's how things really are as opposed to how we see them yeah great so so nirvana is 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 effectively correctly seeing um the three signs of being yes yeah it, it is um though bear in mind that you know um you know for teaching uh, uh and learning about buddhism you know we we use all these words we break it down into some sort of stimata um, but when you actually see it in reality, it's, you know, it's not like those words screaming out at you that, you know, this, this is impermanence and this is Dukkha. You just see it as a whole, you know. So, so uh, it's a bit like, you know, um, when you want to go somewhere, you look at a map. You know, a map basically shows you how to get there. But, uh, you, you know, when you're actually driving there, you know, then there is a lot more that, that you see. Uh, and it's it's just you know comes naturally to, to you, uh, so it's a bit like that. Uh, so 
so this is you know using the teaching uh, um, explanations at sort of halfway stage when you actually see the true reality it is it is those things but the, those words are superfluous you, you don't need them anymore yeah yes it, it's it's just striking that as opposed to other other faiths there's there's less of a sense of salvation and redemption more of a sense of clarity and understanding yeah. and through that perhaps incidentally there may be this sense of but it's it's yeah. clarity yeah yeah it is it is clarity um and and, and in fact uh, uh, that that is a very important part of it because because of clarity we see things correctly when we hanker after things we know that uh, why perhaps that's not skillful so you know clarity helps with all that but also you know you talked about salvation uh, clarity brings about salvation as well uh, because uh, it's salvation because we do not harm ourselves and others because of the clarity so in that sense there is salvation as well and in fact you know uh, natural empathy arises within us for ourselves and for others uh, you know which is part of salvation as well uh, and the natural empathy arises because we see that we are all in the same boat whereas you know our normal saying is you know uh, being separate from everyone whereas um, our seeing turns around and we see we are in the same boat and then empathy arises and our concern for i me and mine is also reduced and therefore also empathy uh, arises and so so therefore there's a sense of salvation for ourselves and for others as well, which is a natural um, thing that comes about. Right, right. Okay, that, okay, <laughs> right. So you can put your hand down, yeah. Are there any other questions? Right, okay, good. Okay, I'm just wondering if, since you've got a little bit of time, uh, yeah, I'll talk about... Oh, sorry, Nohid. Uh, I was muted. I was talking. Oh, oh, I've got one question here. Uh, right. came through the chat. Uh, I'll read it to you. Yeah. What is the difference between Dukkha and Samsara? Okay, Dukkha and Samsara. Um, well, uh, you, you can actually... Uh, so dukkha is part of samsara. So being in samsara is is dukkha. So in a way, you can take take them as synonyms. Um, so so a mundane world is what samsara is, and and our mundane world is uh, is the world of suffering. So in a way, you know they they're similar. Um, the world of suffering, the world of dukkha is samsara. I hope that answers that. Uh, Nivedita, uh, if uh, you got your hand up, if you got a question, uh, would it be possible for you to put your video on so I can see you when you ask the question? Okay, I was actually cooking for my son, so oh. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Um, um, my question is, if everything is suffering, so every little thing, whether we are preparing for job studies or in our daily lives. Um, and Buddha took this path of nirvana. Yeah. So does it mean that Buddhist practice says that we stop everything or focus our mind in meditation or that's how we eliminate suffering from our life? How to control that suffering? Because it is at every step. Yeah. Yeah, you're right. You know, uh, as I also explained, you know, even though we are happy, uh, there would be you know many many moments not to your liking you know in a course of a day uh, uh, so th there's there's always you know undercurrents uh, of, of things that are not quite that not uh, suit us so uh, that, that, that's always there um, so uh, the answer to your question is actually the way out is you know what the a last questioner actually pointed out is clarity you know clarity arises with the practice clarity arises as to why that suffering is arising 
So, uh, you know, this, this satisfactoriness that's perhaps, you know, linked with everything that we're doing. Um, we, first of all, you know, as I said, we notice it, you know, some, in our everyday uh, lives, sometimes we're not even noticing it. Um, it's just, uh, there are some undercurrents, you know, and it, we're just not feeling at ease that we don't notice it uh, exactly. So the, the first part is we notice it. And then after noticing it, and I'll, I'll be talking about this in uh, future lessons as well. Once we notice it, uh, we brought it into awareness and that there's an energy within that. And then what we do is uh, usually what happens with that energy, especially if it's uh, something that is causing a lot of suffering or a lot of craving is that energy is quite powerful and it, it wants to run away hmm. and uh, and it, it it wants to be acted on um, but what we do in the practice is we learn to contain that energy we do not fritter it out into action so if it's craving we do not run after that object but we notice that energy and we learn to contain it and in containing that energy we are building strength and and um, and then we start seeing eventually why this energy is arising you know how our seeing might be flowed and it 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 all then um uh, starts leading to some sort of clarity that you know our um uh, seeing is not quite correct and, and gra gradually, you know, through practice, it gets clarified. And those, and these energies, um, you know, even if they arise, um, uh, you know, because of karma, some of these energies, even after clarity has come in, might still arise because, um, and I'll talk about karma in a future lesson, because of karma, they, because of past actions, they, they might, even after clar reaching clarity, the, some of these energies will arise, but by that time we have the strength to contain it, and it it we won't run away with it, and uh, so we 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 are building strength, uh, and uh, that then you know that's the transformation that happens, uh, um, and uh, and uh, underlying all that you know we, we just become clearer and clearer about you know what we are you know, why we react to certain things in certain ways, why it is skillful or unskillful to react like that. Um, uh, so, so that's the process, uh, briefly. Does oh, that thank help? you so much. Yeah, thank you so much. So basically noticing it and uh, just realizing what is going on and gather that self-awareness, yeah. it builds up the strength of that calmness. Yeah. That's it. Okay. Yeah, right. yeah, and uh, and uh, 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 I'm, I'm saying something which is a little bit more advanced. That uh, 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 since we're talking about the energy, I think it's worth me saying this. You know that energy that's in craving, for example. Mm -hmm. You know we. Uh, it might seem, you know, when I'm talking out that you know we contain it, and we. It might seem like you know it's an energy that we have to do away with. It, it's actually not that. What happens is that energy is actually very useful energy. It is a life force that's in us. It's just simply that that life force has gone awry somehow because of our uh, deluded seeing. So what happens is that instead of that energy being wild, it gets mm -hmm. tamed and then it becomes a truly guiding force within us. It's it's uh, so that it's it's actually a transformation of energy rather than you know doing away with that energy. Okay. 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 Thank you so much. Okay. okay. Thanks. Bye. Hi, Rohit. I have one one more question came through the chat. Yeah. Okay. Is the suffering of love and compassion to the parts of us that are suffering within mindfulness practice something that you will speak about more? Can you read out the question again? Is the suffering of love and compassion to the parts of us that are suffering within mindfulness practice, 
something that you will speak about more? Question okay. mark. So the person who asked that question, are you able to unmute yourself and um, ask the question in person? Perhaps I can understand Hi. a little. Uh, Hi. Sorry, I, I yeah. think I think I'm autocorrect. Okay. Me. I'm 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 not great with that. I was just wondering about the the sort of this the the noticing and the developing awareness and then ease and calm. Yeah. But you sort you sort of I mean I'm using the word love. I think you used the word compassion. Offering um, that part of us that's suffering kind of love and compassion is that something that you'll talk about more? Because it's something that that I find particularly useful. But I don't know if it's okay. Um, uh, you know I I I will I. I do mention, you know, things like empathy, you know, I mean, I just mentioned empathy yeah. to uh, one of the previous questions, you know, it, it, it's a natural quality that develops and, and empathy is what le leads to compassion because we realize we are all in the same boat. So it's, a, it's, a, it's something that arises as something um, by itself in a way. So if, if you're practicing correctly, it arises by itself because it is actually part of our nature to be compassionate. It's just that, you know, when we are concerned about me and mine and what I like and what I don't like, then that compassion is hidden. But it is within us, it is part of us, and that's what opens out. Mm. Yeah. Okay. Is that Thank is that you. okay? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Um so the person marked HL, if you want to unmute yourself. Hi, yeah, Hi. the uh, the H is for Henry. You can can you hear me? Hi, Henry. Yes. Hi, right. Um, when um you were talking about um seeing things for the way they are, mm -hmm. um, I think I was just trying to frame that process in a way that's a bit easier for myself to understand. And uh, I've spent however many years of my life seeing things a particular way and learning to do it that way, whatever yeah. that actually tends to be. And I'm yeah. going to spend X number of years for the rest of my life you know, continuing to see it however that way. And I was wondering, is it, when it comes to seeing uh, the way things are, is it more about cultivating qualities that currently exist to to get better at that? Or is it more about dispelling and removing uh, the, the kind of learned behaviors that I've got so far in terms of, yeah. so I, I see things as X at the moment, for example, and yeah. am I supposed to kind of stop doing what I'm doing at the moment and that in doing so will help me or is it more about cultivating existing qualities to try and get better at seeing things for the way they are yeah okay you 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 shouldn't do away with uh your normal way of seeing things because you know um uh, the, it, it is based on our intellectual capacities basically so, you know, for example, you know, we, we go to school, we learn, um, you know, various um, subjects and we build an intellectual framework and we use that, uh, all that is useful. Uh, um, so, uh, uh, but, but within that, um, what sometimes happens is it gets misguided and it gets misguided when uh, craving arises basically you know cra second noble truth says craving is at the bottom of it so um let me give an example uh um yeah um you um you want to say someone invites you um out and you you just don't feel like going out you will uh you know make some excuse and and not go out so underlying that is this feeling of not wanting to go out you know that doesn't uh, so, so as long as you recognize that that's what's happening then you can still use the process of planning you know planning uh, to, uh, to do things uh, uh as long as you know that sometimes it gets mixed up with um uh with our passions actually and um uh and then we're not getting the right information so rather than saying you know we do away with everything that we've learned so far this new thing is something additional 
uh, uh, and th that's a new way of seeing things. The intellectual way of seeing things is still valid as long as it is not mixed up with the passions. The new way of seeing gives us that clarity as to when this old way of seeing is guiding us correctly and when it's not guiding us correctly. So, uh, so there's a clarity that opens up. So it is like um, an, an, a new additional way of seeing which also means it guides us in our usual way of seeing as well. So we shouldn't actually do away with it because, um, you know, um, our usual way of seeing ha has many positive things. You know, for example, you know, the um, progress that we made in science, in medicine, you know, would not have happened without, you know, all the intellectual seeing, you know, uh, seeing that is actually not necessarily based on true reality, you know, it's based in science, um, uh, which actually is actually manipulation of the pictures, um, you know, um, like, you know, um, uh, if, uh, if, if, you know, I talked about a table as exist existing last time, in science, it actually does exist, you know, um, you know, the qualities of, uh, of a matter that it describes certainly exist, mm -hmm. um, but the true, the, the other way of seeing, you know, from moment to moment seeing shows us that there is something slightly askew with that, the true reality is slightly different, and then when we have got that tool of seeing true reality, we can actually use our normal way of seeing things, but not be fooled by, um, by it. So in other words, we see both sides of the picture, um, uh, and uh, actually there's a saying, saying in Zen which I follow uh, which, which is form is emptiness and emptiness is form so w w uh, emptiness is the true reality form is what we see, how we see things normally so it says that form is actually its nature is empty but you know, if it was just emptiness that we were seeing it would be useless within that emptiness, we do have to see the form as well. So it's not like we do away with uh, our usual way of seeing. It's just that the, this new way of seeing adds clarity. And with that clarity, we know when we are using the old way of seeing things correctly or whether it's misguiding us. And it really, really does misguide us when it gets mixed up with passions, you know, what, what I like, what I don't like, um, you know, when it comes to all that, you know, feeling angry with someone, then it really does does actually misguide us. Yeah, Is it sounds cool? almost like if I if I had blurry vision, I wouldn't try and cover my eyes. I'd try and find the right pair of glasses. Exactly, 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 exactly. Okay, okay yeah. no, thank you. No, thank you for your response. Yeah. Okay. Um, Anna Maria? Yeah, yeah, I want to put, I don't know, I want to give you an example if I'm getting this right. Um, so I do coaching and I do leadership coaching and some of my clients are really determined and really, um, they, they thrive, you know, and they kind of get really hooked into success. Mm -hmm. um, so there is nothing wrong with being with determination or with success, but it's the way they relate to that and the intention they have behind. So yeah. in many cases, their sense of worthiness come from the knowledge of those successes and, and that ambition. Yeah. So I think what I'm getting at uh, what you're saying is, is, is more what is behind of the behavior no. than the behavior itself and it's how do we relate to those things yeah. more than what we do so in their cases their sense of worthiness or self-esteem or self-love come from a place of wanting acknowledgement yeah and being appreciated yeah. and then there's kind of that veil in front of yeah. them yeah. about why what's the reason behind doing yeah. something yeah that's that. Uh, yeah, Anna Maria, thank you very much for that. That is a very good example. In in fact, I think that also answers Henry's question a little bit as well, because uh, you know, there's nothing wrong with success, and you know, if our normal 
um, way of doing things means that we want to succeed at something, there's actually nothing wrong with that. What is wrong with it is this veil that is put over success. Uh, you know, uh, we're hankering for success for some sort of status or some sort of recognition. Uh, and, and then it can go askew. Uh, so that's a very good example. Uh, thank you very much for that. Okay, is, uh, uh, is there any, uh, anyone else? Uh, is there, won't do, is there anything in chat at all? No, that's it. Okay, good, okay. In that case, um, we can end today's class and we'll meet next week when I'll talk about the fourth of the Four Noble Truths, which is the path of practice. So I hope you all have a good week and see you next week. Goodbye.